Welcome to beautiful Lucerne in central Switzerland. My name is Danny Wiersberger. It's a privilege to speak to you in these coming minutes about the topic of choice of law in international commercial contracts and the instrument that was born in The Hague but continued to live here in Lucerne and elsewhere. I will tell you how this came all about and what it is all about. Let's look back for a moment. There have been several attempts to unify the approach to a general party choice in the field of contracts in the course of the 20th century. Except for introducing party autonomy in certain instruments such as the Securities Convention, they failed. The most recent initiative was launched in June 2006 when the Council on General Affairs and Policy of the Hague Conference invited its permanent bureau to prepare a feasibility study on the development of an instrument concerning choice of law in international contracts. The assessment of the feasibility of such an instrument continued until about three years later when the permanent bureau issued a report on work carried out and a suggested work program for the development of a future instrument proposing the preparation of a non-binding instrument on the law applicable to international contracts. For reasons of time constraints, I will skip the drafting history from now on. Suffice it to indicate here that it has been thoroughly described in a book that I had the privilege to co-edit together with Jan Nails of the University of Johannesburg and Thomas Kartner Graziano of the University of Geneva on the principles, including commentaries and country reports from over 60 jurisdictions and from organizations such as Ancitral, Unidra, or of course, the Hague Conference. The book was published last year in 2021 in the spring by Oxford University Press. Now, what are the principles all about? The overarching principle, as we have already heard, is party autonomy. When parties enter into a contract that has connections with more than one state, the question of which set of legal rules governs the transaction necessarily arises. The answer to this question is obviously important to a court or arbitral tribunal that must resolve a dispute between the parties, but it is also important for the parties themselves and their counsel in planning the transaction and performing the contract to know the set of rules that governs their rights and obligations. Determining the law applicable to a contract without taking into account the express will of the parties would often lead to unhelpful uncertainty because of difference between solutions from state to state. Party autonomy, which refers to the power of parties to choose the law that governs their transaction, enhances certainty and predictability within the party's primary contractual arrangement and recognizes the parties to a contract may be in the best position to determine which set of legal rules is most suitable for their transaction. What are the principles and what are they not? As their title suggests, the principles do not constitute a formally binding instrument such as a convention that states are obliged to directly apply or incorporate into their domestic legislation. Nor is this instrument a model law that states are encouraged to enact. Rather, they are a non-binding set of principles which the Hague Conference encourages states to incorporate into their domestic choice of law regimes in a manner appropriate for the circumstances of each state. In this way, the principles can guide the reform of domestic law on choice of law and operate alongside existing instruments on the subject, for example, the Rome 1 regulation in the European Union or the Mexico City Convention in Latin America, both of which embrace and apply the concept of party autonomy, but with certain important differences. It is also important to note the limited reach of the Hague Principles. They address only the effect given to agreements by the parties for a commercial contract as to the law that will govern it. They do not address how the applicable law is to be 
be determined in the absence of choice by the parties. As the principles influence law reform, they should encourage continuing harmonization among states in their treatment of this topic and perhaps bring about circumstances in which a binding instrument would be appropriate. I am together with Arcata Brandao de Oliveira. She has been a senior researcher here at the University of Lucerne. Uh, Agatha, being a knowledgeable uh, expert herself now in the field of international commercial, uh, private international law, will ask me some questions that we prepared to give you an insight into salient issues concerning the principles and party autonomy in international commercial contracts. Agatha. Thank you, Professor Gisberger. So, the first question is, what were you expecting when you were assigned as the chair of the working group? I was expecting an interesting group of persons that would discuss on the basis of proposals made by the Permanent Bureau salient issues and prospective rules of an instrument but I would never have expected such an interesting and diverse group uh, as I found it after uh, we started working together in 2010, which were really uh, experts of a very high level from all over the globe, not only experts that were academics, teachers in universities, of those there were eminent persons as well, but there were also experts that have wide knowledge about the practice of international private law and the practice of international commercial transactions. So we really had a great composed, greatly composed group uh, that made it possible to move quickly because we didn't have to discuss the common denominator, which was private international law. That was all in the hearts and the minds of uh, every working group member. Very interesting. And now I'd like to move on to the substantive core of the principles. And could you highlight to us what are the innovative uh, aspects of the instrument? Yes, uh, I think the one rule that is mostly debated uh, nowadays is Article 3 on choice of non-state law because it's so innovative. There was some surprise within the working group itself uh, sometimes that we went as far as we did go in that we proposed the uh, possibility of choosing non-state rules of law even in court litigation. As you will know, the principles do not distinguish in their main part between state court litigation and arbitration and they don't do that with regard to uh, state non-state law either which is of course heavily debated because in most of the states still uh, the state legislature would not allow parties to choose non-state rules of law instead of state rules of law uh, when it comes to state court litigation, but only when they have an arbitration agreement. But we went one step further because of inputs from practice, also from innovative input from theory, legal theory, and thirdly, also from organizations such as the ICC. And uh, we, of course, had the discussions on the table that were led in the preparation of important international or supranational instruments such as Rome 1. As we all know, the preamble now doesn't allow mm -hmm. non-state rule of law uh, in, in international contracts, as opposed, for example, to the Mexico Convention, which does. And we were debating that heavily until, as I uh, said already in the introduction, until and including the special commission meeting when we found, I think, a compromise, which may be, of course, uh, debated, but I think it's a good compromise uh, 
to, to allow that to a certain limited extent, namely only when the non-state rules are a balanced set of rules that are uh, introduced in the industry and accepted to a certain extent. Could you tell me about other features of the yes. principles? So that was one innovative aspect that was discussed the most, but there are other innovative aspects such as Article 5, which allows a form less choice of law, which is not uh, the case in all jurisdictions, but I think it's a good solution and it's a modern trend to allow choices of law without asking for a particular form. Then we have Article 6, which was inserted quite uh, late into the original draft uh, it provides inter alia a solution to the vexed problem of the battle of forms, or more specifically the outcome when both parties make choices of law via the exchange of their standard terms. And uh, there is a rule now contained in Article 6 on what happens in this situation or what should happen in this age, the situation of the battle of forms. And then we have uh, Article 8, for example, that speaks about renvoi. It contains, of course, the normal solution that renvoi is excluded. Renvoi is excluded normally in contracts, the law of contracts, and rightfully so. But, and that's the innovative things, unlike many other instruments, the principles allow the parties to expressly agree otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's interesting to think that since we started drafting the instrument, it's been already more than 10 years. And I'd like to ask you, uh, do you think that the panorama has changed compared to the time that you formed the working group? Yes, that's more than 10 years now, and we all know what has happened since we've had many crises. We had, uh, especially also the pandemic, and we see that globalization has come to a certain halt in certain aspects, speaking about delivery change prob chain problems uh, that arose from the pandemic and also the most recent events, the unfortunate events uh, in, in uh, Eastern Europe and also, of course, the Middle East that shows how important public policy has become for certain states if it has not been already there before even more so than now and we have the problem that we see uh, for example when we uh, look at the sanctions against russia but also other sanctions against iran and uh, when we look at them we immediately think about how do they influence private law are they extraterritorial provisions that have to be uh, considered as overriding mandatory law? Are they public policy? To which extent is such public policy important for a certain contract? These are all questions that need to be addressed more and more. Fortunately, the uh, hate principles have address the problems and I don't think that what is in there has to be changed but it may have to be interpreted looking at these trends. I see and talking about the sanctions and public policy overriding mandatory rules uh, what can you tell us about article 11? Yes article 11 is the provision that speaks about public policy and mandatory rules, overriding mandatory rules of law. It does not formulate rules indicating to what extent public policy has to be respected or to what extent overriding mandatory law have to be uh, respected directly. They contain only conflict of law provisions uh, leaving certain freedoms for the states that will implement the principles if they do, or parties that want to adopt the principles to note what the standards are. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the structure of Article 11 is quite simple in that it distinguishes 
one thing between the public policy and the overriding mandatory rules of the forum. And those public policy rules or mandatory overriding mandatory provisions of laws stemming from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, this is the only provision that distinguishes formally between litigation, state court litigation and arbitration, because of course, arbitral uh, tribunals do not have a forum. They have a seat, mm -hmm. which doesn't have the same function as, as a forum in a state court. So that's why we formulated a particular provision, Article 11.5 for arbitral tribunals. And for state court tribunals, all other four provisions are important. Uh, I think they reflect the quite overwhelming trend of respecting, of course, the mandatory rules of the forum, if they have an overriding nature, and the public policy of the forum. That's, of course, also a concession to certain states that would never adopt such a set of rules without seeing their own public policy accomplished, if it's international public policy from their perspective. Uh, but also there are certain rules that were a little bit more debated and some uh, are criticized more heavily, especially the rule in, I believe it's Article 11.4, that allows also to look at the public policy of the law which would be applicable in the absence of choice, mm -hmm. which is not a typical rule, let's say, for example, in Europe, but some US states, such as Louisiana and Oregon, have adopted such a rule. And this is, so to say, a concession to, to those um, trends. Uh, Puerto Rico is also a state mm -hmm. that has uh, introduced such a, such a rule to not exclude the thought of a certain importance of the public policy rules of the Lex Causa to make the law that would be applicable in the absence of choice. But otherwise, these are important reminders of things that would be done anyway by state courts that uh, were uh, introduced into the principles to also let the parties and their counsel be aware that such rules will have to be respected. Mm -hmm. by them. I see. And you mentioned that Article 11, for example, makes a distinction for arbitration. Could you expand on this practical perspective for arbitration, how the principles could be useful in arbitration? Or what is the take for practitioners who work more closely to the arbitral scenario? For arbitration, the rules reflect nothing new, at least not for most arbitral institutions. And uh, you may know that there has been a survey by uh, the Hague Conference that included uh, quite a number of arbitral institutions and asked them whether they would consider the uh, Hague principles for their own rules for the drafting of their own rules, or whether, uh, at least in the arbitrations uh, being conducted under their auspices, uh, the uh, rules would be considered. And the overwhelming answer was yes, they were considered, they were helpful, and they are helpful in international arbitration to not only know that choice of law must be respected, but also the limits mm -hmm. of these choices of law, especially Article 11, mm -hmm. uh, speaking about public policy and overriding mandatory rules, but also, of course, the possibility to choose non-state law, which has been something that in arbitration has been accepted for decades now. If you look at Article 28 of the arbitral model law, it reflects exactly mm -hmm. this, this possibility. So that's not a new in arbitration. Uh, but as I said, I think the limits are even more important than the freedom, which in arbitration has always been accepted. And those limits are important even for arbitration as well. Good. 
it will be very interesting to hear from representatives of arbitral institutions themselves how they conceive and perceive the uh, choice of law principles, especially their opinion on whether a continuation of the efforts to unify the choice of law issues would be helpful, for example, to formulate rules uh, that would be applicable in the absence of choice. It would be no problem to unify the approach uh, of connecting factors, what are the closest connections, but in some areas such as consumer contracts, employment contracts, uh, insurance contracts, transportation agreements, there would be a lot of opposition to a certain rule from a important group uh, whatever the rule would be. So it would take time, but I think, and that has been also the majority feedback from those surveyed, it would also be helpful to have such unified rules for uh, the situation in which the parties have not made any contractual choice to establish the closest connection and to even go further and contain presumptions for certain closest connections for certain types of contracts. And that would be a task, I think, that the Hague Conference would be well fitted to, to undertake in, in the coming years. Maybe even in the form of a convention, mm -hmm. because here hard rules may be more important than when we speak about freedom of the parties, mm -hmm. where soft rules are as helpful. But here, hard rules would be helpful to really give guidance to not only arbitrators, but also arbitrators and also um, state courts on what would be the cost. Uh, would you be in favor of an all-encompassing convention? So the principles together with these fallback rules, provisions on choice of law in international contracts? Or think... do you think these, these are two separate? I Endeavor. think, no, I think they, they, they fit together um, and it would be nice to have an all-encompassing instrument. But politically, of course, the sensitivity has to be respected because freedom of contract, party autonomy is accepted almost universally, whereas what the closest connections are, if there is no choice made, there is no uh, unanimity at all. So just politically, it may make sense to keep these two issues separate, to leave the success of the choice of law, party choice of law instrument, unattempted, as opposed to the attempt to, to find solutions for, for um, fallback rules. So I could well imagine that these two instruments could be kept separate and the states would be at liberty to adopt one but not the other instruments. I see. Good. What do you have to say regarding the future for harmonization of choice of law? So we have some success uh, that we can observe in certain states. The Hague principles of choice of law have been adopted in the form of legislation, for example, in Paraguay and recently Uruguay. The, uh, these pieces of legislation reflect the rules almost verbatim, which is, of course, very, very welcome. And we also see more and more states considering the rules. We have seen it in Australia in parliamentary discussions. They have come to a halt for other reasons at the moment. We have seen it in Mozambique, which wants to, wants to adopt something uh, along the lines of the um, hate principles. We have seen some development in Korea. So that, that are good news. So for example, in Israel, the uh, Attorney General has, has cited the rules and also the, the court has taken this in uh, consideration. So that's exactly what I foresee. And of course, some data, the collection of data would very much help 
developing further these rules and we have a project which is a continuation of, of the earlier project that um, organize a database with case law legislations that could be easily accessed in the field of choice of law and would make it much easier for both practitioners and courts and of course auditor tribunals to uh, apply rules that are internationally respected to their cases. Yes. Professor Gisberger, thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure to learn from you and to discover uh, all these details behind the scenes. Of Again, it has been a pleasure to be able to convey the picture of this choice of law principles and the principle of party autonomy. As the first speaker of this conference, I hope you will enjoy the rest of this conference and good luck to you all. Thank you for listening.